Welcome everybody, may this uh, find you in peace and prosperity. Uh, welcome to this uh, today's conversation. So um, uh, first, yeah, the quilly of the day, which is uh, ginger, ginger juice, which will connect uh, with quite a few of the topics we're going to cover today. Um, I mean, I I really like it. I mean, uh, I really like ginger. I love um, ginger candy, ginger tea, um, even uh, uh, ginger capsules for <laughs> complicated reasons. But uh, no, I mean, recently found out you can actually get, you know, straight ginger juice and I've been uh, drinking quite a bit of it. It's uh, quite a fascinating quillia. It is slightly bitter and it's definitely acidic and slightly spicy. Uh, it's not overwhelmingly, you know, so in any of those dimensions, but, you know, together there's kind of some kind of a additive multiplicative uh, effect. And it ends up being like quite a strong, quite a strong quilly actually. Um, um, definitely comparable to like 5,000 Scoville units on a different axis. You know, this is a combination axis. Uh, that said, at the very least, when it comes to the throat feeling, um, I think it is pretty comparable to something like 5,000 Scoville units, something like Tabasco sauce like you saw in the previous previous episode. Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about monsters, well, making friends with monsters, and of course, <laughs> you probably can guess what this is about. Utility monsters, of course, of course, you know, basically um, states of consciousness, states of being that are either, you know, so extremely intense or so extreme in the valence direction, either positive or negative, that they kind of like become, uh, they kind of become, you know, their own thing, something to treat kind of uh, in their own terms. And uh, I mean, definitely I recommend um, for those of you who, <laughs> who are not faint of heart, uh, read, uh, yeah, basically the logarithmic scales of pleasure and pain. You can also watch the uh, YouTube presentation I gave, which is in the Quilia Research Institute v uh, YouTube channel, uh, which goes into kind of the the reasoning for why we think, you know, these extreme experiences are actually orders of magnitude more intense and more valenced than people, you know, generally might imagine. Anyhow, um, today I'm going to be talking about, yeah, basically uh, a, a few of them. Uh, I have, uh, yeah, basically psychedelic spaces, uh, you know, super painful stuff, and also um, the quality of uh, drug withdrawal, uh, as well as uh, drug side effects, which uh, for some people it can actually become... You know something in the space of kind of utility monsters so okay i said uh, ginger juice would be connected to the topics in in what way so ginger juice is quite a quite a fascinating thing because um you know you've definitely heard that like it, it helps with like nausea you know it, i definitely think that uh giving ginger juice or you know ginger candy a try if you're undergoing something like chemotherapy or something like that experiencing a lot of nausea you know it's it's, it's worth worth a shot like it may actually just work perfectly uh, as opposed to like some of these stronger, um, stronger anti-emetics that have all, all kinds of side effects. And I think uh, one of the, you know, the probably the reason why ginger juice actually helps with uh, nausea is that it's a partial antagonist of the 5-HT3 receptor. 5-HT3 receptor. There's a lot of talk about 5-HT2 as being kind of the underlying, you know, main psychedelic uh, receptor. You know, some somebody like Thomas Ray might dispute that, might say it's the 5-HT7. Uh, there's a, a lot of interesting, you know, work to be done in there. Um, but, um, you know, 5-HT2 is clearly implicated in psychedelic actions, at least on, on, on some level. And pretty much every psychedelic, you know, has like affinity, if not, you know, uh, you know an agonist action on 5-HT2A or 5-HT7. But interestingly, a lot of psychedelics also have activity on the 5-HT3 receptor, um, such as, for example, some of the, what I might call the dumb psychedelics in a sense, uh, dumb because there's just like things that are, you know, better, uh, similar effects, just like basically a lot lower body load, like less nausea and cramping and, you know, just horrible feelings that, you know, you want to, you want to die and throw up. Um, some of the examples of like psychedelics, I would say, are kind of in the in the far end of uh, just like very very bad body load. Is like 2CE, 2CT2, 2CT7, 2CP. Um, all of those, all of those phenethylamines uh, are very heavy on that, and possibly things like uh, foxy methoxy. What is it like? MIPT, 5MeO, DIPT, 
basically the IPTs <laughs> uh, seem to also be a uh, Fire T3 agonists, and uh, and you know that's the, one of the crazy things. People take you know two CE. Sometimes they have this very crazy strong effect uh, with lots of nausea and lots of side effects and body load, and they go through it and they come out the other side and they reinterpret what they experienced as kind of like a karmic process of some sort, something, you know, they, they had like demons inside, they had like, they have like these like built up, like, you know, like this satisfaction with life or their work or partnership or, you know, whatever it may be. And like they, they, they sort of like, um, come out the other end and they, they feel very victorious and, you know, they, they actually acquire some kind of uh, ego attachment to the ordeal. You know, they, they are proud <laughs> that they went through it. They actually succeeded at it. Um, and, uh, and here is where, you know, I would definitely say something along the lines of, you know, maybe it was just the 5-HT3A or 5-HT3 agonism. And, uh, I mean, apparently, if you drink one or two shots of ginger juice, together with, you know, your 2CE or something like that, you will get, you know, the exclusive 2CE visual qualia, which is actually very different than other 2Cs, um, uh, quite a unique thing, um, without the body load. And your experience is just going to be way better. And I would claim actually just far more therapeutic and like just plain better for you, you know, just for your health, for your happiness. Um, it's possible there's like some things you may not think about uh, because you're not suffering. <laughs> and, you know, maybe that's a bit of a loss. But you have to consider the opportunity cost. That when you are in, you know, an ecstatic, blissful, and yeah, quite frankly, quite bizarre experience as uh, 2CE, without experiencing the body load, there's a ton to discover in that space too. I mean, it really, really, there's like a lot of opportunity cost. Like having a difficult psychedelic trip has a huge opportunity cost, which is what you missed out on by not having an ecstatic, beautiful trip, you know? And yeah, anyway, uh, I definitely want to put that out there. The other way in which, you know, ginger juice, at least this one, I'm not sure about uh, all of the others, uh, uh, is uh, how it's connected with utility monsters is, uh, you know, one of the worst things that this has on it is like a ton of uh, vitamin C. And, you know, a lot of people, most people think of vitamin C as kind of like this very, uh, this very benign thing, you know, there's like, you know, uh, Pauline, I think, the, the uh, Nobel uh, chemist, uh, you know, prize winner um, is saying that like, you know, we should be taking 10 grams of vitamin C every day and, and so on. Well, uh, here is like a pretty sad news, uh, vitamin C uh, taken in high doses uh, over a long period of time cause kidney stones and kidney stones is like one of the worst things that you can experience in your life extremely traumatizing a horrible ordeal well it's one of those things that uh, you know it's a log normal distribution um, meaning that like you know some people may experience kidney stones as just like really bad and some people may experience it as like you know basically hell um, like really quite frankly and uh, um, yeah, I mean, like, I don't take vitamin C supplements precisely for that reason. Um, I've calculated with a Fermi estimate that, you know, a single, you know, 500 milligram vitamin C capsule uh, or, or tablet uh, contains within it approximately 0.1 seconds of expected uh, kidney stone uh, pain ordeals. I mean, making some, some basic assumptions. And um, that's a ton. I mean, like... Over 10 days, you're likely to, you know, if you take one of those a day, a lot of people take more. Um, that's like one second of a kidney stone. Um, and like the things that people would do to just have like one second of relief when they're having a kidney stone, it's just so like just so much. Anyway, it's a big topic. Uh, you know, this has some vitamin C. I think it doesn't have that much. It does say that it's 99.7% uh, ginger juice. So the remaining maybe vitamin C as a uh, acidity controller, which uh, I'm fine with. It's not very much. Uh, you can definitely taste it, but anyhow, that is literally one of the reasons why I'm not drinking this whole thing <laughs> on a daily basis. I am a little bit concerned though of uh, down-regulating um, my 5-HT3 or like upregulating, sorry, my 5-HT3 receptors. Um, so far, so good. Like, I mean, I've had like up to like five shots of these a day and then just like stopped. 
and had like no nausea as a consequence. But I, I bet if you're, you know, if you drink like the whole bottle of it every day, a bottle of this every day, and you completely discontinue, I bet it's going to be like a horrible withdrawal that probably shares some quality with some kind of an opioid withdrawal, you know, similar, similar story. Anyway, 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 so um, let's talk about uh, bad trips for a moment, you know, and it's definitely one of those things that like if I was on a psychedelic uh, or if there was somebody on the psychedelic around me, I would actually just not touch the topic um, because it's, you know, it's really bad. I mean, like the negative valence of a bad psychedelic trip can be really outstandingly terrible. Um, definitely, definitely, uh, I don't think the, the story of a uh, it's just a difficult experience really does justice to like what the emotional Armageddon of a bad trip can be. I mean, if you're curious or skeptical about these, like, you know, find on YouTube, like people describing their horror stories, their ayahuasca horror stories. And it's really nothing to, to laugh about. I mean, um, and, and the thing is, and uh, uh, here is one of the things that I'd say here is that like we need basically some kind of bad trip theory. You know, we, we need a, a good, solid, scientific account of what the hell bad trips are. And I'm pretty, pretty sure we're not there yet, you know. So I brought a couple books to, to show you, to maybe kind of like uh, frame how I think about this uh, these days. So the first one is Amusing Ourselves to Death. It's a pretty interesting book. I recently quoted uh, a little bit of it on uh, quality computing um, because, you know, it, it has uh, it talks about like how like the, the medium uh, of communication in a sense is uh, something that we expect uh, for particular types of truths, you know, and uh, uh, he basically references this uh, Western African uh, tribe where basically their legal system is based on oral tradition and sayings, you know, it's kind of like you have these two people battling, um, you know, in a turf or whatever, and they come to the chief uh, of, the, of the tribe and they expose the problem and, the, you know, what the chief does is they listen to both sides and then they think for a while and they try to, you know, go through their internal library of all of the different uh, sayings that they that, there, that there exist um, in their oral tradition. And then they find one that kind of fits the situation that hopefully will make both persons uh, happy. And, you know, sayings like everything that goes up must come down or, um, you know, like... I don't know, but there's a bunch of like, you know, cultural sayings. And uh, um, the thing is, that is the form of that truth takes in that tribe, you know, uh, that is like how they think of truth in there. Um, and uh, I would claim that when it comes to psychedelic experiences, we are kind of at that level, you know, we are at the level where precisely sayings such as like what goes up must come down. Um, you know, or, or like you get what you deserve or, um, I mean, I think there's like some really unhealthy ones, like, um, we're all, uh, progressing towards God anyway, or, um, like basically, you know, saying we're all one consciousness and kind of like brushing under this, un, un, under the rug, all of the, the, the moments of experience that actually suffered on a, on a bad trip. Um, and, uh, that's really terrible. Uh, I mean, honestly, I, I look forward to a time where we actually take care of every moment of experience because, yeah, I mean, anyway, okay, let's go into bad trips. So what are the theories that people have about these? So even in the last uh, video that I made about 5-MeO DMT, I got like, some really interesting comments where you can actually kind of see the, the various theories that people have about them. And one of them, for example, is uh, there being like you know, they're kind of a, a visions, you know, they're visions of the future. Somebody was saying on 5-MeO DMT, he experienced millions, he said like maybe hundreds of millions of souls drowning and uh, um, and suffocating and experiencing pain. And uh, and then he interpreted that as being a, kind of a vision of the COVID pandemic about to happen or something like that. Um, I don't think that's a very plausible explanation myself. I don't think God was revealing to this guy the COVID was about to happen by making him experience in advance in this kind of uh, uh, foreshadowing, you know, uh, pre precognition sort of way, um, uh, all the bad qualia that people are, were going to have. Like, no, 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 no. I think like, you know, on 5MeO DMT is one of those utility monsters. You may 
uh, if you take a high dose and you're not titrating over several minutes, you know, the high dose and bam, like the probability of like an extremely negative experience is like significant. We're talking like at least 10%, um, deeply traumatizing and extremely negative. And here's the thing, uh, exactly in our culture and how we think and how we process information as biological beings, highly valenced experienced are, 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 are interpreted as always containing some deep truth. You know, you experience profound suffering of some sort, you will generally try to rationalize it in a way that is like ego syntonic, in a way that like vibes well with your construct the ego, uh, sense of self. So yeah, I mean, like if you have some kind of a, uh, you know, inclination of like thinking of yourself as a messenger for, for God or something like that, yeah, for sure, you experience a hellish state on 5-amino DMT. Of course, that's a message. What else could it be? <laughs> Well, uh, other people actually th think about it in terms of karma. Now, um, there's truth that on, let's say, 5-MeO-DMT and in psychedelics in general, um, the state of consciousness gives you kind of like some very, very detailed understanding of basically in what ways you're uh, storing traumas in your body, in, the, in your energy system, you know, and, and also how past negative experiences as well as like current addictions are shaping basically your priorities how you, you know, how you approach the world and what you do and what you care about um all of that is true but <laughs> it is not true that what goes up has to come down it it is not true that these things actually even out perfectly um and I can I can show you a, kind of an example here. I mean, like uh, I love these uh, these little toys. It's called a Rioscope, I believe. Uh, this one is a birthday gift by uh, Romeo Stevens, uh, a good friend of, of mine. And uh, basically, you can study turbulent flow in this thing. It's quite a fascinating toy. Um, and basically, I think like a good five meo DMT trip. Uh, I mean, I was talking on the other on the other video is kind of combing the field, basically changing your topology such that you're able to really comb your field. Now, I think a really good positive 5 meo dm tree that is rejuvenating is one where the all, the, you know, the energy flow of your consciousness is like this. It's kind of this laminar flow. Basically, there's no resistance. And, a, you know, a resistance-less, perfectly symmetrical laminar flow of energy, wow, you know, you experience that and you will almost certainly realize that you hadn't scratched the surface of what <laughs> happiness and well-being and bliss, I mean, and spirituality could be all about. On the other hand, you know, you have some problem, either like, let's say, uh, some type of uh, intense addiction or um, like, you know, you just broke up with, uh, with somebody or like they fired you from your job, you know, somebody's filing for divor divorce or whatever. Uh, or honestly, even just chronic pain in your body, like something something like that. Um, well, that is going to create kind of like turbulent flow. So you can think of this as like the imperfection in your nervous system. And then like as the energy is trying to, you know, move around your nervous system, yeah, it's going to lead to kind of these like little eddies over here. And like that can be really extreme, you know, if, if you have like very high energy, which, you know, the equivalent here would be like moving very fast. <laughs> Uh, this is definitely going to be true on DMT or 5-MeO DMT, where like whatever like is bugging you, um, if it comes up again during the trip, yeah, it's going to be like this thing. It's going to be like a sore, sore thumb or um, um, like a spike that is basically going to mess up your energy flow. And and here's the thing: there are basically turbulence is this kind of like a phase transition. And this connects to the other uh, big utility monster, which is uh, uh, drug side effects and, and withdrawal. Because, um, and let's say, I mean, Fenibut is one example of it, that like a lot of people take Fenibut, um, they experience like some kind of mild relaxation and it's fine. Some other people take Fenibut, they experience profound euphoria and um, very awesome feelings of well-being, maybe even like... Uh, you know, aphrodisiac effects, like some interesting cognitive effects. And uh, it's fine. I don't want to bash Fenibut. But the people who, you know, get hooked and take it every day, that is when you get to a very big problem. Because in particular, 
I mean, like the GABA receptors, you know, they're the worst type of you know, chemical dependence you could have. Um, but even then, I mean, like, precisely because of this misconception of, you know, whatever has to go up has to come down, that like withdrawing from something is kind of giving you the equivalent of negative valence that you kind of obtained before. I think all of that is total nonsense. I think it's just plain false that like, a, you know, a cold turkey, you know, fennibut withdrawal from like, I don't know, whatever, like something insane, like 20, 20 grams a day. I can guarantee you that the negative valence that you're going to experience there is going to be far worse than the positive valence you experienced anywhere throughout the time that you were dependent on it. Um, and I ascribe that to basically similar to a bad trip, basically a phenomenon of turbulence that basically, yeah, if you're withdrawing a little bit, you know, if you're doing, lowering your dose like over the course of, of a long time, um, it's going to be a little bit unpleasant. It's definitely kind of like that sore or thumb or like, you know, like a little sticking point or something like that. Yeah, it's going to disrupt your energy flow. But if it's not too much, it's not going to get to the phase transition where you end up in turbulence. And and that is the thing. Like when it comes to, you know, these like super turbulent states, there's no law of nature at all that says that, you know, the, the, the books have to be balanced in any way that's just not true i think like you can you can get a lot of turbulence out of like relatively little you know positive valence that you got be beforehand and vice versa i mean like people almost it's almost like people don't like this idea because it, it makes you really confront you know fully confront the 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 falsity of the just the world theory which is this theory that basically everybody gets what they deserve um that you can almost certainly <laughs> find a way of discontinue some, you know, something like a fanny boot dependence by just like taking 0.1 gram or 0 0.05 grams a day less every day or maybe even every week and over the course of several years, like go all the way down. And in that way, you may almost possibly just not even feel the withdrawal. It's just going to be very mild. It's like so mild at no point you experience that turbulence. And I think that, you know, that is the adult in the room kind of uh, approach to these things. It's not, you know, let's face the, the worst right now because, yeah, it's not going to, it's probably going to make it worse. It's going to traumatize you. And I'm definitely going to say that, like, super intense, like, drug withdrawal, uh, from what I've read, um, as well as, like, something like a bad trip, uh, whether it's ayahuasca, LSD, or it's especially 5-MeO, DMT, is something that can really break down your spirit. It can really hit at the core of your whole energetic system and just mess it up such that like <laughs> for years you're going to experience turbulence and dissonance and something isn't quite right. And I think like that's absolutely definitely something to avoid um, at all costs. Uh, definitely, you know, off, off, you know, kind of like another explanation that would find like a very, uh, you know, a misfit for, for the sort of phenomena that I'm trying to get at. It's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, this book in particular, LSD and the Mind of the Universe, fascinating book. I do recommend reading it. It is really interesting and it's phenomenologically rich. And if you have taken a high dose of LSD in the past, you will probably resonate a lot with uh, uh, what uh, Christopher Bach ha has to say about it. Uh, I mean, this is basically the, you know, the retrospective report of 73 very high dose LSD trips taken by somebody who's like very cogent and very rational. Or f yeah, quite rational. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, basically he, he stated that, you know, he would take like 500 micrograms of LSD, which is zero tolerance and, uh, and experience, uh, first of all, hell realms, like just extraordinarily unpleasant realms. And that for a while he thought that it was his bad karma that he was burning. But uh, at some point it was just so bad, like it just kept happening over and over again um, that he figured out or figured out, quote unquote, that uh, he was actually processing the bad karma of humanity. Now, if he's true, well, good. He's been doing something really good for us. Like we, we definitely have something to thank, uh, thank him for. He might as well just be terribly wrong. He was just experiencing this, you know, high energy turbulence effects, profound dissonance, just for no particular gain. <laughs> and I honestly tend to, um, 
tend to resonate more with that. <laughs> In which case, he was turning himself into a negative utility monster over and over for no good reason. Like, let the pointlessness of, of that sink in. Ah, uh, a lot of people do that. Like, yeah, cold turkey, fanny boot, heroin, whatever, or being stupid about psychedelics. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, like, what else is there to say? I, I do want to say that, you know, practically speaking, uh, I think this is part of my, yeah, personal, a personality trait. It's just like something I do is like, you know, if I'm at a party or at a festival and uh, somebody comes to me and, and uh, shares that, you know, they took LSD, let's say 200 micrograms of LSD like half an hour ago, um, which has happened actually multiple times <laughs> in different settings. And especially the person, you know, explains they have like no tolerance to it. Um, and also, you know, maybe they're not very experienced with it. I will go from a mindset of like social butterfly, like party mode into kind of mom mode. Well, maybe if you want to be, um, you know, mystical or something, you know, you know, trying to connect with the uh, green Tara of Buddhism, the universal mother or something like that. Yeah, I mean, basically all of a sudden I recognize that this person is probably going to be experiencing an intensity and uh, and a weirdness of experience they have never faced before and that they're probably not prepared for that and all more so that you know their friend group is almost certainly not prepared for that either um, even if they you know have ego constructs around it especially if they have ego constructs uh, concerning like being tough or like taking hero doses or any of that stuff <laughs> then I really become the mom of, of this person for the next, I don't know, however many hours, honestly, like uh, uh, spontaneously or like impromptu trips at like a lot, a good number of people in these scenarios. And uh, and all of them have been very thankful for it. Um, later on, they said like, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. And like, yeah, thank you for <laughs> providing a good space. And uh, But yeah, I mean, basically, if you come up to me and you say, I just, 200 micrograms of LSD with no prior experience and no plans, I think of you as a utility monster. I mean, not in a um, moral sense. It's just, yep, this is uh, something we've got to deal with now and uh, we, you know, better set up the conditions so that, like, nothing terrible happens. Uh, that's basically how I think of it. Um, <clears throat> likewise, um, I've got to say... Uh, yeah, well, one final note. This is getting too long. I will, uh, basically, um, I do think, likewise, you know, in the space of psychiatry, I do think we're kind of at the level of explanation of like what goes up has to come down, where like, really actually what we need is like deep understanding of the differential equations for how, uh, you know, near transmitter upregulation and downregulation and interactions between them, as well as how it affects connecting specific harmonic waves and turbulence and you know, the full explanation for how, like, effexor works or whatever, it's not going to be, it just lowers your dopamine levels or, you know, anything of that sort. Um, and uh, my understanding is that psychiatrists, by and large, have just not much of an insight into actually the risks of many of the medications they prescribe, especially when it comes to something like antipsychotics. Um, you know, it used to be the case in the 60s that, you know, doctors uh, and researchers would uh, not give things to their patients that they themselves haven't tried. I almost feel that should be the case for, like, antipsychotics. For, for um, I mean, okay, like, I should absolutely mention that if you're, like, in an intense psychotic break, that's itself a kind of utility monster of its own type. And for sure, taking a short-acting antipsychotic can completely completely, you know, get rid of the utility monster quality of, of that person. Um, but, uh, you know, for somebody who's experiencing, like, garden variety, depression, or social anxiety, it just, I think, profoundly unwise. Uh, not only because it will make the person anhedonic and, like, not particularly, you know, be able to experience happiness very much, but actually because of the long-term consequences. In particular, I'm just going to want to mention akathisia. And akathisia is this, you know, inner sense of restlessness. Um, people associate it first, like most of all, with uh, opioid withdrawal, uh, but also restless legs is a version of it. And uh, about like 5% of people experience it naturally throughout their lives. 
um, in severe form. Um, but psychiatric medications have a very, very high rate of increasing the probability of like long-term, permanent, irreversible akathisia. And uh, the, the, the big suspects here, the common suspects, are antipsychotics, first of all. I mean, I was reading some articles about the probability of, you know, giving you akathisia uh, for long-term treatment of antipsychotics is between 30 and 60 percent, which is insane for, you know, a, a, such a horrible condition to have. Um, benzos, you know, long-term benzo medication, and I would mention also, yeah, all the th things of that sort, like uh, Fennywood, what was the other, uh, gabapentin, like things of that sort. Um, yeah, or, you know, jo Jordan Peterson, he was on uh, clonopine uh, for, for several years, and it got to the point that, like, he was experiencing, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, benzos are just so bad for your nervous system, like, they're, like, neurotoxic, um, that um, it's, it's actually one of those cases where um, the euphoria that you get from them uh, is, you know, maybe one-tenth of the negatives that uh, comes from them, uh, especially with long-term use. Um, and yeah, I mean, somebody like Jordan Peterson, yeah, he was experiencing profound akathisia just from taking benzos for so long. And, uh, and yeah, he describes it as like hellish, you know, just so bad. It's just so bad. Um, and, uh, SSRIs, apparently about like 10% of people who are prescribed SSRIs uh, develop akathisia. Again, like, yeah, I mean, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't roll a dice of, like, having one in ten chance of developing this condition in the long term um, for most of the conditions for which SSRIs are prescribed. I do not think is worth it. And uh, I really think there has yet to be a definitive cost-benefit analysis uh, grounded on the experience of, like, actual users over the course of decades. And I suspect that a, a, a hedonic accounting <laughs> of of that type of medication will come out very much in the red if not in the black um just overall tremendously negative only a subset of people like generally benefit from them and i think it's kind of like a, the lock of the draw at that point um one last thing i wanted to say is that yeah this whole idea of what goes up has to come down i think um we will have a complete revolution of our understanding of uh basically like the you know neural correlates of consciousness in, in, the, in the future, and especially connected with a hedonic tone, that there's like some fascinating indicators such as basically ibogaine um, that shows that basically you can reverse something like opioid tolerance, uh, even long-term opioid tolerance from even hardcore opioids like heroin or something. You can basically, you, you know, you do, don't even need the crazy psychedelic effects where you feel that you're, you know, confronted with all the bad that you've done in your life which may or may not be necessary, I don't know, but probably not. Um, apparently, even if you just take microdoses, you know, sub-hallucinogenic microdoses, um, for people who, for example, experience chronic pain, you can lower the dose of opioids over the course of um, a month or so by also combining it with a, with a low-dose ibogaine, where basically you can reduce the dose by like 90% and still get the same, the same pain-relieving benefits. Um, and... That's like ibogaine, which is like this natural product is like not optimized for this purpose. And it's also a crazy psychedelic that, you know, interesting in its own way. But I suspect, I would actually bet on this, that in the near future, we will actually find drugs that profoundly reverse uh, tolerance to all kinds of uh, other drugs. Um, where, for example, you may go into a clinic uh, when you're experiencing benzo withdrawal and, uh, and just completely no ha not have any benzo withdrawal at all, all of a sudden, and like not have any cognitive impairment as a consequence, not feel weird or anything. And uh, over the course of maybe a month or so, just being able to discontinue that treatment and just have no, opi no opioid, no benzo withdrawal at all. I'm very, very, I don't know, I'm pretty confident this is coming and that there are like actually some really, really good research threads of specific molecules that are like pointing in that direction. Um, so yeah, no need to, uh, be moralizing, no need to be, uh, uh, have kind of these like chal childish, uh, mindsets about, uh, theories of how these substances work. Anyhow, 
I do believe to wrap up that, um, yeah, when we're talking about psychedelics, we're talking about, you know, extreme pain or extreme bliss uh, for that matter. When we're talking about like drug with like intense work, drug withdrawal, we're, we're ta talking about like any of these things that we might classify as utility monsters, you know, orders of magnitude, more pain or pleasure. Pretty much everywhere that I've looked at, uh, people really seem like toddlers when it comes to like how to handle these and you know for the most part including myself I'm just pointing this out I'm not necessarily better better at it but uh yeah I mean just like trying to guess you know say something like uh your bad trip was because of I don't know a childhood trauma that you had like just that's you know just think that that's the case that's the full explanation <laughs> yeah sorry no that's that's a yeah, that's just not the level of complexity needed for uh, for understanding these. Um, uh, we really need uh, the adult in the room. And that's why I will reiterate, um, please, 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 please don't, you know, take 5-MeO DMT in a shamanic setting. Like, people who administer it, for the most part, again, they're toddlers, like playing with the, you know, the medicine cabinet <laughs> just have no idea what they're doing um if you're really interested in it and you're like you know psychologically robust um i would recommend again like taking very small doses first uh, acclimatizing to it and if you want to experiment with a larger dose i would titrate it over the course of several minutes basically taking like one or two milligrams at a time and with that slow buildup basically the i think like the envelope of the the intensity of the experience will not have this sharp peak where most of the super negative stuff tends to tends to happen um i actually envision you know 5meo dmt clinics like the really legit ones in the future are going to actually probably preload you with some other substances um like fennyboot actually comes to mind no but like honestly other things like perhaps like you know uh 5 t 3 a antagonists, like honestly, that's another one. Um, and basically give you like an infusion of 5-MeO-DMT over the course of like 20 minutes, precisely dosed and at a very, very precise schedule that is like very soft, almost kind of this sigmoidal, sigmoidal curve, well, uh, pretty flat, so it's like, you know, pretty flat slope, but uh, still a little bit of a, anyway, sigmoidal, wavy, wavy kind of like dose schedule. And I suspect that is going to be just far more blissful, far more therapeutic, far more beneficial than any of these other, you know, shamanic ways of administering it. And I don't mean to to make it clinical at all. I mean, I think like, you know, beautiful images and, and a really, you know, uh, welcoming, uh, open heart kind of environment will absolutely be essential. I just don't believe that, you know, your um, average, you know, self-described shaman knows what they're doing no <laughs> no 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 not at all there's like several levels of you know complexity that needs to be climbed before we we really know what, what we're doing with these things um anyway take care of yourself take care of your moments of experience and uh, may you find happiness thank you for tuning in